relatively well. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, I'm Venerable Chitananda. I live in California um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains and it's redwood forest here. The reception for internet might, might be a little sketchy at times. So please forgive me. It should straighten itself out if, if something happens. We've had a DSL installed a couple of weeks ago and it's new. And so it might be a little bit buggy once in a while, but I think so far we've been okay this morning. Um, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yep, so uh, I think the usual format I, uh, Chanda or Venerable Chanda uses is 30 minutes of meditation, guided meditation. I'll do a little bit of guiding, but maybe we'll mostly just sit together and then we'll do a, a brief Dhamma reflection and Q&A. So yeah, okay. Um, everyone get a little comfy. <laughs> Settle in. A few deep breaths in and out. <clears throat> So from a, a few conversation I've had with um, several monastics this past week, the topic of attitude versus intention has come up. And so setting a intention for our meditation time together and in general, um, looking at decreasing the suffering in our lives and ultimately the the main intention for meditation as a Buddhist is to end all of our suffering. Having this overarching intention, we need to also have the right attitude towards our meditation. Not so much grasping at attaining jhanas or attaining psychic powers or deep states of bliss that can really do some damage in our progress if we're really clinging and craving after them. So having an attitude of, of metta is one good way to start out. Wishing yourself well-being. And extending that to the others around you wider and wider. Or maybe the right thing for you at this moment could be gratitude. And I'm, I'm going through some interesting
And having the gratitude for the ability to breathe. Breathing into our meditation. Even if maybe some of us are having difficulty breathing, it's working well enough. It's working enough for us to be able to practice. And using our breath to help us move into an attitude of relaxation and calm and openness.
And then maybe checking in part way, seeing what our minds are up to. Have I slipped into a nice meditative state and slipped back out and I'm trying to cling to or crave that nice state again? Or am I still open and relaxed and letting go? Still inclining towards peace or not? And just gently guiding ourselves back if we've gone off.
And as we come to the end of our meditation, thinking about our attitude more, how would we like to, how would we like our orientation to be for the rest of the evening? And just seeing what's skillful for us at this time. Maybe it's more gratitude or metta or self-acceptance. Maybe it's the openness to hear some dhamma, have a peaceful, tranquil evening afterwards, or whatever seems most skillful and right for you at the time. Electronic bell caught me off guard there, sorry. <laughs> A little more abrupt ending than I intended. <laughs> um, oh, I also apologize for the, the road traffic. This is Independence Day weekend here in the States and there's more traffic on our little dirt country road than usual. And sometimes there's some music and more airplanes flying than usual. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit today about time um, and things around time. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed a talk I heard from Ajahn Brahm quite a while ago. He was talking about the nonlinear nature of time and we were speaking with some people about the sort of re rebirth idea that they weren't comfortable with. And one of the things they brought up was, was about um, the Buddha not being able to see as far back for everybody, their first experience of, of, of rebirth or birth, say. And so looking at time as nonlinear, it's more circular. To me, it makes sense that you can't find the beginning because there isn't really a beginning to begin with. <laughs> And how we spend our time is really important. We don't know what's coming next and we want pretty much to live a, a good skillful life in the here and now as much as possible. And when we think about our work life or our family life, you know, we want to have good wholesome jobs or um, good and or good people to spend time with in a company that does wholesome things and coworkers who are supportive and not, not toxic to be around and using mindfulness in our everyday kind of tasks can help with that. Um, but basically we spend so much of our time with our work. And if we're not at work, a lot of the time we're thinking about work or we're talking about it to friends or you know for support from other people in our lives so it's really important to make sure we're doing wholesome things right livelihood type things um, but also just for our own own sense of inner peace to making sure that the companies and industries we're supporting are going to be wholesome for ourselves and the people around us and the planet if possible um, I know at, here at the monastery, we have a lot of work projects going on because we just started this place. And right now we're ripping out the bottom floor of our building and putting in a better foundation. And we're gonna put in like a bathroom and laundry unit. And so I know a lot of times for me in meditation or just talking to other people who come visit the monastery, I spend a lot of time like thinking and talking about these projects <laughs> and it's, it's good to be able to have something, I, I consider that a pretty wholesome, not in any way, um, you know, negative thing to be putting my mind and attention on. But at the same time, is this really what I want to be thinking about a lot? It's, it's um, good not to waste too much time on things that are not I would say like helping you make spiritual progress <laughs> or reflecting on your, your mental states. So just something to work with. And yeah, aside from work 
you know, having good Kalyanamita or at least wholesome people to spend time with who want to keep precepts and who are not going to drag you into things you don't think are wholesome or are against precepts. And just being around um, nice environments, spending your time out in nature, spending your time at home, making your home comfortable. I know with COVID, we've all had adjustments to be made at home to make it more suitable for you know, work life or just spending time there, making it more pleasant and comfortable so that we can feel at ease to practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, not, not spending too much time on things like entertainment or um, gossip, <laughs> worrying about other people and what they're doing. It's, it's a big drag if you think about how many times just throughout the day I find myself wondering about people, not in a gossipy way, but sort of in a more wholesome, like, oh, I wonder how they're doing. I wonder how that illness is going, or I wonder how their new baby is, or, you know, things like that. And it's, it's fine to think about wholesome things like that, but it's also good to not waste too much time on it and come back to your own kind of inner mindfulness and what you want to be thinking about. Um, and I know like um, we, we were talking to one of our lay friends, she is interested in becoming a bhikkhuni and we were at a Bayagiri Buddhist monastery in Northern California. It's associated with like Amravati and the Ajahn Shah lineage, that's where they started. And we were talking with the abbot of Abayagiri, but the abbot from Chithurst Monastery was also visiting. So we were kind of chatting with the two of them and we were talking about all the time we spend on monastery things. And our lay friend was like, oh, that's, you know, it's so much work. You have to do all this stuff and you build these big buildings and you do all this, I'll have all these programs and ceremonies and things. And many, many kutis, and it's just so much work. It doesn't feel like real renunciation, just digging into the practice and really, you know, going for enlightenment. And I was explaining to her that none of us want to do this for ourselves. <laughs> like Venerable Chanda really, really works very hard to try to get the bhikkhuni place going in England. And it takes a lot of time and mental energy and mental space. And she's always emailing and, and talking with people and um, doing Zoom programs. And so are all the other people leading the other communities. But it really is an act of service. Um, it's total Donna. Like I know from myself and um, Venerable Santusica, who's the abbess here, we have this small little cabin and we just put in our first kuti and I'm finishing the interior of it still now. And we're working on the bathroom and the downstairs laundry. And it's, if it was just myself and Venerable Santusica, we wouldn't be doing any of this. We would just be using the cabin as is and practicing. But the time and energy we're putting into this is not for ourselves. It's for the people who come and benefit and want to become bhikkhunis also, giving other people the opportunity. So yeah, something like this is definitely worth our time <laughs> even though we aren't spending most of our time on the cushion or doing walking meditation or reading or you know practicing in other ways it's still a wholesome act of of dana and that's a great way for everyone to spend their time you know doing charity work or talking to friends who are having problems and being supportive with them those kinds of things are are the things that are really worth our time as well so um, yeah, and just making sure that we're not wasting so much time making every second count in a way that real sense of some wega, because we don't know what's coming next for any of us. I mean, with COVID, I worry about some of my family who don't want to get vaccinations. And I, I sometimes think about it like, oh, they're going places and, and I don't know if they're going to catch COVID with, especially with the new variant, it's like much more contagious I hear. And so I kind of wonder how that's going to go. And 
wonder how much time they've got left and wondering about how much time in return, how much time I've got left <laughs> and wanting to, you know, despite whatever our lives are like, busy with work things or family things to make sure we are giving enough time to our formal practice as well. I know it's really beneficial for me to listen to Dhamma talks too, if I can't, uh, if I'm too tired to meditate, say, and it's not going, going very well for um, relaxation or concentration or, you know, concentration, the C word. <laughs> um, so yeah, just, just making sure I am keeping my mind on wholesome things, spending my time listening to talks or, or talking to my Kalyanamita. It keeps me on track and makes sure I'm not wasting too much time on email, say, <laughs> or similar things, you know. Yeah, or social media is a big drag. I hear from people. I don't do so much myself, but I know that I communicate with people a lot through that. And it's just like, I think I'm spending 10 minutes on it and I look up and half an hour has gone by. So it can really suck us in if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'd like to hear more from all of you reflections or questions you have. I'm not a big talker myself, so I'm much happier to hear from you and We've got a lot of wisdom in this group. I know the last couple of times I came, um, people had really nice things to say that I benefited from. I like hearing other people's thoughts and reflections. So I'd like to open it to share now. I know it's a little early, but I think that's okay. I don't think anyone minds, yeah. I think David just wants to say something. Um, hi. Um, interesting how you look at um, your work of, say, building the retreat center that you're building now and preparing it for others. Um, it, it, I'm not sure if I'm thinking of this correctly. Yes, we can, um, we can meditate, we can uh, enter uh, mental states, but there is an element of using the work as a form of meditation, of using it um, in a sort of, skillful mindful way that especially if it's work that has as you say it's um uh, you know if, if the work is skilled work in the sense of it's good for the community mm -hmm. uh i'm not sure if i'm sort of ex explaining how i feel that in the sense that the work can be a meditation, a, a meditation in itself. Am I right? Or I don't quite know if I'm thinking sure. of the right lines. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I agree. Um, so right now I'm working on the inside of our cookie and it's putting in wood panels on the walls. So it's kind of repetitive <laughs> and kind of rhythmic and repetitive. And that, that's a good meditation object a lot of the times things that are re repetitive can help you kind of get into the meditation zone too um i was thinking i was thinking more along the lines of donna practice but i like this meditation idea too it's nice <laughs> yeah we were let's see what was this uh we we're talking about something out of biagiri mm. something about this Ajahn, Ajahn Yanako, the abbot was saying he really liked repetitive things too for that reason. I wish I could remember exactly what he said. <laughs> it's kind of nice, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, it's definitely service and it does help the heart anyway, you know, regardless of whether or not you can do the work meditatively. 
it's still uplifting for me. So, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Mira. Yeah, Mira. Well, I was just thinking about doing repetitive things and uh, as I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking as um, um, uh, walking meditation is something very repetitive and I think when you start doing things 100% it's already kind of meditation and uh, what I'm asking myself is what's about time then when you do repetitive things in a completely aware kind of, of doing, then time vanishes. You can do it four hours, okay, then something will hurt <laughs> when, when you're nailing something or you're doing handicrafts. But uh, I think it's, it's really that time gets another, gets another mm, form of dimension. Then I, I I don't know how is it then good it's okay when it's also then dharma practice you're not walking in a, in a kind of um, a, a, a silly job or something like that but I I can imagine that mm, well I'm I'm not working in repetitive things that it can be also be a meditative state perhaps I should do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> my, my partner. <laughs> but but I'm interested in this, this feeling of time then. And, and I um I, I made the um experience that, that if you're really into it you forget about time. Yeah. So this yeah. is just what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point, yeah. It is kind of um, interesting with perception. I mean, if it's something unpleasant, it can seem to drag on forever too, you know, <laughs> cleaning something pretty gross or, you know, doing some kind of difficult work, it can seem like it's a lot longer than it is. And if it's something more repetitive or it, even if you're, like you're saying, getting in the zone of just doing the work, it can keep going and you feel like no time has passed, kind of like the social media thing. <laughs> It was like, you look up and it's like, oh, wow, that was an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. And like the state of the mind matters a lot. Um, yeah, if you're kind of in a pleasant state of mind, things seem to go by faster, even if it's tedious or uncomfortable work too. I think this made me think of um, Ajahn Gunha, who's a, a Thai monk. He's the nephew of Ajahn Shah, and he's got a big monastery in Thailand in what they call like the Alps of Thailand because it's mountain region and it's really nice weather and people like to go there uh, to different resorts and things. And so it's a very pleasant environment there. And he's kind of, um, I guess, I guess, more importantly, his style of sort of meditation is more like in the moment. And he says it's really important to have um, sati and panya all day long. So the mindfulness of what you're doing and the wisdom around it. And he thinks that you only really need, even as monastics, you only really need maybe two hours of meditation every day. But the important part is what you're doing with your mind the rest of the time too in your day to day because you know that's often where i find insight arising is throughout the day during regular activities more so than right on the cushion a lot of the time so his his idea is you spend your days like his monastics work very hard too there's always some kind of project going on and or some kind of crisis with whatever's already existing, something's falling apart or, you know, plumbing problems were happening a lot when we visited last time. So 
it's it's watching your mind and seeing the right way to look at things and noticing when your mind is doing not so wholesome things judging or um spacing out or not being really present with whatever it is you are doing and i think that's something we've taken back to our monastery a lot too is is since we are starting up and there's a lot to do we have our two hour of meditation kind of quota every day but we also so like morning and evening pujas a little bit of chanting and an hour or so of meditation um and then throughout the day it's it's watching our minds and having other people around is really helpful for that too because they can help you see when you're not on track when you're you're being careless or or mindless about something and it needs more attention it can help you like check your mindfulness or <laughs> you know kind of um if you're if you get irritable or something with them it's a good reminder to be like okay what is my mind doing how can i work with this so it doesn't bleed out on other people that kind of thing yeah so i we we appreciate this style where you don't have to just be walking meditation or sitting meditation a lot and you can still have the sati and even samadhi while you're doing things. Sometimes when you get off the cushion, if you're in a really good mental state, you can continue that with your work and it, it becomes more of a meditation. Everything becomes more of a meditation if you can maintain that throughout your day. Hi, James. <laughs> yeah, it's James. Okay, I'll ask him to unmute. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what you're saying about trying to keep mindful and stuff like that. It's, um, yeah, it's hard. I'm fairly new to the practice. So it's kind of only fairly recently I'm really making serious efforts to sort of take it out into the wider world. Mm -hmm. And so sort of keeping mindful at all times is. Yeah, it's difficult, particularly when I've been tired a lot recently. When you're tired, it really is hard, mm -hmm. isn't it? It really is hard. But then I was thinking today that um, at those times, it's even better. It's even more important because you can be mindful of the fact you're angry and making sure you're not kept snappy and irritable, which is the sort of thing that I would possibly do. But but yeah, it's it's it's. I think I think I'm sort of slowly getting to grips with it because I'd have. I'd have whole days at work and I'd think, well, not one time today have I thought about it, you know, not, not thought about anything other than work. But now more and more, it just seems to pop up, you know, it's like, um, and, and in terms of doing sort of like good deeds and being a, a sort of good person and everything, just trying to remember at all times, because I, I just work in a shop, so it's not like I'm building monasteries or anything like, uh, you know, more, more um, significant than that. But I still think it offers plenty of opportunities to, you know, for kindness. To, you know, you, you can you can chat for longer with a customer. You know, we get customers that are obviously a bit lonely or whatever. And the temptation is to sort of like, I think previously, because uh, I'm always busy at work previously, I'd be like, maybe it's a bit of a waste of time if I'm chatting with them for like half an hour. But uh, nowadays, I kind of feel like I want to give more. Huh. And that's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's good. So, uh, yeah, I, I think... You know, sometimes you change very slowly in your thinking, so you, it's hard to know whether you're making progress, but I kind of think I am. I and mean, one thing that aggravates me, though, is that, um, uh, well, not aggravates, but it, it's, it's like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll know that I've said the wrong thing or sort of done the wrong thing almost instantaneously after doing it. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, do, does mindfulness ever get to the point where I might actually be mindful enough before doing the thing? But if there's any sort of tips or any, any sort of suggestions on how to sort of maintain better mindfulness during my working day when I'm working in a shop, you know, is there any anything I can do to sort of help this along? I mean, I'm assuming meditation must be the reason why I'm getting better at it in part um i guess but uh yeah any any other tips in which i could so i could get better yeah it sounds like it's it's moving in the right direction so that's nice to hear um one thing that comes to mind is especially for beginning i think ajahn jayasaru is an english monk who lives in thailand that we also went to go see last time we were there and he's been a monk for oh, 40 plus years now and um 
he says he still does this himself. So he calls it chunking. He takes a chunk of time and he, he practices having a lot of mindfulness during this chunk of time. So it's not like an all day mindfulness 24 seven kind of plan. It's more like a learning how to do this um, and then having it spread longer throughout your day. So like in the morning when you're getting ready for work, you you can tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be mindful for this period of time. Like during my shower, I'm going to be totally mindful during the shower. And you're, you're really working with it, paying attention to everything, kind of really present. And then and then you give yourself a break <laughs> and then you can tell yourself, oh, the first two hours I'm at work, I'm going to be really, I'm going to try to practice mindfulness for the first two hours and, you know, just see what you can do during those two hours and then give yourself a little break afterwards. So in a way, it doesn't feel as harsh and demanding on ourselves to have it this way um, instead of so intensely like do or die. I'm going to be mindful all day long and, you know, <laughs> not going to make any mistakes and get grumpy with anybody because that's just unreasonable, <laughs> a little too hard on ourselves that way. And another, another bit of advice um, that was given to me from an, another monk when I was asking him about the same sort of thing, I was saying, you know, I, I always find myself losing mindfulness frequently, <laughs> thoroughly, you know, making mistakes, saying things or doing things that are not as skillful as they could be. And he said, you know, you can, you can try your best to be mindful as long as you can throughout the day. But every night, ask yourself, you know, when were the times that I lost mindfulness? And kind of look at that, look at those times, maybe look for patterns, kind of examine what was going on, what are the things that tend to make you lose mindfulness and not in a harsh way but just like whatever comes to mind at the time and also I think I've I've added in looking at the times when I have been mindful and how that works out and kind of reflecting on the good things that have happened like oh yeah I was really careful when I was talking to that grumpy plumber you know like <laughs> that worked out better that way that was good you know encourage yourself too at the same time so I think, yeah, I think that's good. Uh, I have I have started doing that in the evening, sort of reflecting on things, which is sort of a well. On the yeah, now I think about it, I find it difficult because I'm perhaps tend well. I realise I'm tending towards being somewhat judgmental, and of course that's judgmental myself. So uh, you have to do it kindly, obviously, and and then you know it's, it's sort of awkward sometimes trying to bring these things back to mind because you want to push them away and say no that was embarrassing and oh my god cringe I did that bad you know but yeah I think I think yeah reviewing things and, and looking at it and yeah prepares you for the next time doesn't it and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. insert good intention to be good mm -hmm. yeah and, and then like, that way like you do catch yourself go ahead oh so I like the idea of doing the little chunks I think maybe I could try probably wouldn't start with two hours that's a long time but uh <laughs> yeah a little bit and try and, and do it well yeah yeah it's work your way up uh-huh yeah yeah and and like you're saying the reflection does help you catch yourself sooner and sooner you know yeah. and even after you've made a mistake a lot of the times it's good to say it you know if you've said something mm. and you realize right away that you know oh that was bad I mean, so many times you can stop and be talking to the person or if it, I mean, at least for me, it's usually involving other people. <laughs> when I think of mistakes like this that, that I feel bad about or, you know, that weren't skillful, it's usually involving other people. And if I can catch myself right after I've done it, I can say, oh, hang on a minute. I'm sorry that that came out wrong. I, oh, yeah. you know, I apologize. I, what I really meant is, you know, whatever, whatever you're, whatever a more skillful response would have been <laughs> You're like or oh i'm sorry i said that i should have said you know this instead and that can do a lot for your relationships as well so especially with customers or you know people you work with too family members it's nice it's, to it's sort, of, it's sort of giving up pride and arrogance as well isn't it to yeah. just to, to humbly say oh damn it, sorry i shouldn't have said that 
Yeah. Yeah, it, it's um yeah, it's, it's humbling, but justly so. But I am trying to remember to do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If I make a mistake, try to make amends because nothing else, it 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 obviously well it harms you, it hangs on in your mind. You know, I find out if I make it, then I'm, I'm more likely to come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. But if I can smooth it out or make amends as soon as possible, difficult though that might be, or pride denting that might be, it's it's the way to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And this is what we're doing with practice. We're all kind of chipping away at our egos, chipping away at the sense of self and our ideas about ourselves and wanting to look good in front of other people and all of that. So. I like what you said, James, that was, it's good. And as you yeah. said, too, if nothing else, for our own mental peace, <laughs> it's good. To yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing so much. <laughs> it's good. Mira raise her hand again. So, okay. Oh, no, I stopped. I will never stop again. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, asking myself about this mindfulness and on the other side, a certain kind of spontaneity. Because I, I, I Sometimes I've got the, um, just, Here, we're having a hard or, or don't, hearing don't seem to be, um, Here, we're having a hard um, um, I, I'm, I'm asking myself, um, is this mindful in a way? So, so people just don't say anything because I fear, oh, I could hurt someone. And uh, it, it sounds sometimes to me like a little dictator who says, oh, be mindful, better do nothing. And it's trouble hearing Mira so I'm not catching everything you're saying I think maybe chat okay that's good that's good thank you yeah um so from the little bits i did catch maybe i'll just respond and then when we see your question in full i can i can respond to that too maybe but yeah so an important thing that should always go along with sati mindfulness is sampajanya so it's the mindfulness but also the clear comprehension we've got to know what what we're doing exactly i mean they have this analogy people like to talk about sure you can mindfully rob a bank you know <laughs> that's mindfulness too you're clear about what you're doing you know exactly what you're doing and you're aware of your movements and actions and everything very mindfully <laughs> rob that bank but with with buddhist practice you have to have the clear comprehension of what you're doing too your intentions your actions should be in a line with right action and right speech and right view and you know the whole eightfold path and knowing what we're doing um, is just really important for our karma <laughs> our karma and our progress on the path so if you're spontaneously robbing that bank very mindfully that's not good <laughs> But if you're spontaneously saying a kind word to somebody who's having a bad day, that's good. <laughs> you can do it with mindfulness too. You're mindful of their feelings and, and respond in kind. Um, maybe your chat 
has has her chat come through? No, she's still formulating. Maybe okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can, if if anyone else has a question while she's typing things up, we can um, move on. And if not, it's okay. We can just wait. So even now with all of this sort of dead air time, we can be using this time to see where our minds are, you know, like, am I bored? <laughs> am I upset that not more is being said? I'm staying up for, for some Dhamma time. Why isn't there more Dhamma? There should be more Dhamma. All this, what the judging mind could be doing or, Oh, this is nice. I like quiet time. I could have used more meditation earlier. This is good. <laughs> Silence is nice too. So, you know, while we wait, if no one has anything to say, we can just watch our own minds and spend the time in our heads or spend the time looking at our Kalyana Mita on the screen here. That's nice too. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic has been so isolating for people. So it's kind of um, nice to see so many people interested in Dhamma who are here to share with us. <laughs> uh, can I read uh, Mira's questions? Yeah, please. Okay. She said, my question goes in a little different direction. So her question would be like, is there any contradiction of mindfulness and spontaneity? No, I don't think so. Um, you can be mindful of your spontaneous urges. <laughs> it's like, um, there's nothing wrong with spontaneity if it's coming from the right place. If it's from a wholesome intention that isn't breaking any precepts or, um, yeah, harming anyone in any way. So it's okay to be spontaneous. And yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction. <laughs> Yeah, you can use them together if you're doing something spontaneously. So there is that sutta, I believe, where the Buddha is talking to Rahula, his son, and he's telling him, you need to be mindful of what you're doing before you do it and while you're doing it and after you're doing it. So kind of like what James was saying, wanting to catch these things earlier and earlier. And so you can have a spontaneous thought and want to do it. But it's good to have that mental check on it too, to make sure it is a good thing to do. And it's going to, you know, be for your benefit and the benefit of others, not just, um, yeah, something on a whim that might not have good results. <laughs> yeah. Melanie wants to say something, so I'll ask her to unmute. Hey. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, so grateful to, to be able to join and to see everyone. Um, I was um, particularly touched by what you said about your, your relative, and sometimes you worry about them mm -hmm. because... Um, uh, my parents live very far away from uh, from me, mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel uh, well not guilty, but not so good about the situation. Especially, uh, we had trouble uh, traveling 
between where they live and where I live. And um, I was wondering if you, well, how I can deal with that, because sometimes, especially, I don't know, in the evening or just before going to bed, uh, I'm thinking about it and sometimes worrying about it. So, um, and I don't feel like meditating right at that moment, but maybe I should. So I was wondering if you could give me any tips about maybe how I could deal with that. Sure. Um, I'm assuming you mean deal with it, like internally deal with it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Not like call them more. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. For me, I, I often reflect on karma and um, in terms of equanimity, you know, it's like, this is just the karma we have right now, whatever kind of distance you have with your your parents it's like causes and conditions have brought us to this situation and doing what you can on a practical level um things like calling them more is probably good for both of you both your parents and yourself because you know you're you're doing what you can with the situation you have but a lot of people are in this position, like my mother lives a thousand miles away from me too. So I haven't seen her in a long time either. And talking to her on the phone or um, on the internet sometimes and, and having uh, mutual family friends kind of check on her, see if she needs things. That's helped my own peace of mind. And knowing that I can't really do very much other than that is just having this equanimity, this sense of acceptance of causes and conditions are like this. And everybody's got their own karma and we can't control it all. So it's just like, okay, accept, change what you can and accept what you can't kind of attitude about it for situations like this, at least that's what's been helpful for me, so. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> And it was very interesting to, to hear what James said about catching yourself or saying bad things or thinking bad things. Mm -hmm. And I was very, well, it was very interesting. So thank you very much, James. And thank you for the response you gave, Aya. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Tint is raising her hand. Is that true? She wants to talk. Okay. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Vulnerable. Um, I hope you can hear me properly. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for being here with us. And I'm very grateful uh, to your talk and James as well. Uh, first thing is uh, you are a definition of dana that you are you know doing the building things uh, not for the sake of yourself only for the other people's benefit and uh, another thing is about your the mention of the repetitive work and um, i find is i'm very fortunate to uh, make a note of the uh, your talk this evening because it really encouraged me my study um i am um, um i am an I'm an accountancy and I do a lot of repetitive work and such a terribly boring subject. <laughs> and I'm still, I'm still uh, you know, doing the exams, which uh, some of them I keep feeling. But in terms of feeling, I um, take as a sort of, a, I can see that in a good way because it takes away all my ego. So <laughs> <laughs> no ego left. And whatever that I am uh, making myself better for my education is for that I can uh, you know, help and uh, um, help and aid other people, particularly for that uh, Buddhist uh, uh, teaching and uh, you know, helping the uh, Sangha and monastery. So I find your teaching, uh, your teaching and advice is very, um, um, very beneficial to me. 
in the repetitive work, um, what I do is um, every morning that um, when I drive to work, I take five precepts every day. But when I was in the um, meditation retreat in the Ugo Inga, and we only take uh, eight precepts from the beginning of the retreat, and then we keep that one. But uh, being a lay person at home, I feel uh, more um, encouraged to keep the precept by promising myself every day. So I, I can relate that you are teaching to that repetitive as well, even to, uh, you know, that little short five precept you do every morning again and again. So it's a reminder of that, um, that that were infused in my mind and body by doing repetitive. And another thing is a James uh, speech, uh, like uh, he, he talked to the uh, customer with that sort of kindness. Uh, I, uh, I comprehend as a very good intention. So what my understanding is, um, whatever we do, uh, you know, how trivial or how important it is, the, uh, the, the, the good intention, I think is the most fundamental to, um, to decide whether our action lead to good or, or unskillful. Uh, correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm, you know, my thinking is anything uh, need to be corrected. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I like, I like your um, precepts every day kind of idea. I know that when people do this, that, yeah. that comes to our place, it really helps them remember the repetitive nature of it. And it's like, you're more aware. I mean, most of us, we, we do our precepts, you know, on the full and new moon um, as monastics. And I can imagine as a lay person, just having five to do, you could more, much more easily do it every day than the 311. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but I love that. Um, we had a, a man who was newly Buddhist coming to our place and he said, when he did the five precepts for the first time, uh, he did it once a week, kind of at our at our monastery, and he said it totally changed his life, especially even just like the third precept of, um, well, I mean, yeah, this the idea of sexual misconduct. He took it in terms of like um, not flirting with his coworkers anymore, not being you know, not having any kind of jokes with a little bit of a, you know, tint on them that were, that was kind of not wholesome. And he said it really changed his relationship with his wife completely. Like he was so much more available to her in ways that he didn't think were possible. Like he didn't see it as an issue until it changed. And he was like, oh my goodness, this is great. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing this. So it, it, doing it every day is, is great, especially if you have a job where you know there could be conflict with that. We have people whose companies want them to say things that are not entirely true to their customers or, you know, do, do slightly underhanded things with the government, say, or, you know, there's unwholesomeness that could arise at work on precept levels, not just kind of getting grumpy with someone, which might not be breaking a precept necessarily. <laughs> so, yeah, that was great. Um, Something else you said, Tint, that I'm blanking on towards the end. What were you saying right at the end there? Could you remind me, please? Oh, about the uh, good intention, Van Yeah. Mm -hmm. James, that James, was it. Uh, yeah, the, he, because he he uh, he do the conversation with the customer, which uh, you know, with more kindness and uh, make them feel more good and happy, and uh, you know, uh, to uh, get rid of their loneliness. That's very kind. It is very kind. Yep. Yeah. One, thing, one thing that has come up this week too around intention. Um, earlier during the meditation, I was talking about attitude versus intention. Kind of, you know, they are different. Um, and then we were also talking about earlier this week, we were talking about intention versus impact. And I don't know if that's a thing people have been talking about or are familiar with, but at least in the States, it's kind of a a topic that's been up lately because around sort of racial tensions, it's it's people who are wanting to be helpful and supportive and they have the best of intentions, but 
the impact of the ways they're trying to help. It can actually be offensive or you know, the opposite effect, the opposite impact of what they're trying to achieve by saying or doing whatever it is that they, they perceive as um, helpful and supportive. Their intention is totally correct <laughs> and the impact is totally the opposite of what they want. And so we need to have enough wisdom um, around what we're doing. If we intend something, we have to check it out with the people that we're trying to help. So if James has a customer who's, you know, not lonely, his, his perception of this customer is they're lonely and he's trying to be chatty and friendly and nice. And, and it turns out this person has like, what's that word? Agoraphobia. They like, they're really scared to be out in the world and they won't leave their house. And they're just like total introverts and like really like tight and shut down and closed. And, and I trust James to have the, you know, intelligence and wisdom to know the difference, but you know, that's just an example. Like it could be that this person doesn't want that kind of contact, doesn't want the extra chatty, friendly, nice things. And so sometimes in our social interactions, it's, it's good to check it out with people more like, you have these beautiful intentions, but it's good to see how that's going to impact the other person, the effect on the other person. So, yeah, uh, karmically, I think if you have a good intention, you're pretty safe. <laughs> but when dealing with people and, and all of our own defilements and everybody else's defilements, the defilements of the people we're dealing with, it's kind of good to, you know, kind of the, the expression I use sometimes is knock first, you know, kind of check it out first with them before you do or say, say things, kind of feel how into it, how they're doing and ask them about it instead of just assuming. Yeah, you didn't say anything wrong, Tint. I was just adding that because it's come up for us, so. <laughs> Vulnerable. That's very kind of you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, David. David, want to say something? So uh, I'll send you a mute. Yeah, are you able to unmute? Okay, great. Hi, I uh, thank you for the talk and the uh, meditation. Just a quick question. Those people that are close to us know how to push all our buttons and take us into unwholesome responses. Is there a good way to deal with those situations? <laughs> sure. Yeah, we have, I don't remember who said this, but um, in particular with family, like, I heard this from Ajahn Pasano, but I know he was quoting someone else. He said, like, family members don't just know how to push our buttons. They're the ones who put the buttons there. <laughs> it's like all of our wiring from our, our youth and our, you know, childhood and growing up or just being around people a lot. They, they put extra buttons there that you didn't realize were there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's kind of in line with the discussion on mindfulness. Um, sometimes going into situations, if you know this, this person has the tendency to push that particular button, you kind of, before you come into the situation with them, you get yourself mentally prepared. It's like, okay, this guy is going to say this certain thing, and then this feeling is going to arise in me, and then I'm going to say this certain other thing in this habitual pattern that I always have with this person and so kind of the mindfulness before the encounter can be helpful and then you can you can tell yourself like he's going to say this thing and it's going to emotionally affect me in this way so right now I can sort of reflect that this is just a pattern I don't have to go with this pattern I know what's coming. I can, I can have enough mindfulness and clarity around, this is just a feeling. I have this conditioning, these buttons, this wiring from whatever in my past 
this is just feeling coming through. I don't have to believe it. I don't have to go with it. I don't have to react in the habitual ways that are not wholesome. I can just see this feeling as a feeling and not give it any more energy. Don't think about it too much. Don't feed the feeling with thoughts about, but this guy's like this, I know it. And he wants to hurt me, you know, like <laughs> not, not feeding into this dynamic anymore. It's just like, yep, this is how it is. You can take a step back, put a little distance between you and the feeling, the you and the feeling and um, give yourself space ahead of time. And of course, this doesn't work in every situation because things just come up sometimes, they spring up at you. But practicing this ahead of times in situations where you know it's coming, you, you know the patterns will help you prepare for later. And then you can catch yourself earlier and earlier and, and sort of adapt it to other situations. And it takes time and it takes practice and you're not gonna be perfect every time. You probably will kind of, react <laughs> again in the same way a few times and that's okay you're, you're we're learning we're learning how to work with the feeling and not have it work us <laughs> yeah and it's it's interesting to um think about for me at least family in particular it's it's a very rich practice ground <laughs> yeah i hope that helps i don't know Feel free to follow up question if you need to. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Hi, John. Now we have John Walter. So. Yeah. Hi there, I really like this. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion. Can you hear me, it's okay? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and and actually, I've been reflecting a lot of the uh, on these uh, on these thoughts uh, recently, and uh, and I've shared them for family and friends. I, I've shared, um, and I really like the 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 Dharma that uh, Ven Chanda has sort of enlightened us upon, uh, which was the you know the sort of way we can sometimes ask for, for, for forgiveness uh, to people that we might have hurt. So I sort of uh, reflected on it and I've shared this just recently with, with friends and uh, the, I, consider, I consider you my friends as well. So and I'd like to, um, you know, you do this, I think you do this when you're working uh, together in your monasteries. I, I believe you do this when you can, and we can do this together. It's like, uh, you know, you ask, for forgiveness for these sorts of some of these things that uh, if there, anything I've done through body, speech, or mind, intentionally or unintentionally, you know, I seek forgive. I seek forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Yeah. And if anybody has hurt or harmed me through their acts of body, speech, and mind, knowingly or unknowingly intentionally or unintentionally i offer them my forgiveness mm -hmm. it's very important that we sort of get keep we can keep that in mind and share that now and again isn't it so because we go through life and we just say things that might have get with unintentionally or intentionally it's unbelievable that you know oh yes and actually you did do that to me you know but, um, <laughs> it's always good to clear that air isn't it yeah yeah that's great I loved I it and I shared it a couple of times just recently and I think it has really been good for both how my understanding of the dharma or of dharma and how I could probably be more careful mm -hmm. and you know and others as well so it's good yeah that's I great hope you, you. you do that you do that you do that in your we in your do. time yeah mm -hmm. we do and often when people go visiting other monasteries they do this preemptively, just as you're saying, like you come and you, you bow in front of the elder monastic, whoever sort of, you know, if it's not the abbot, it's the elder monastic that's at the monastery and you preemptively ask for forgiveness. <laughs> if anything I'm about to say or do is off, please forgive me. And, and the same when, when you're leaving, you ask for forgiveness and they are, um, whoever you're asking forgiveness from, monastics 
we're obligated to forgive them. Like if somebody's going to ask, you have to, you have to work with your feelings and your, <laughs> your own kind of inner uh, about it. It's um, I like, I like the way, I like the way it ended where you actually also say, you know, and if I have actually done things to myself, I'll, I'll try to forgive myself. <laughs> Maybe yeah. not now. And if it's not possible, but a bit later, you know, mm -hmm. just recognizing these times. So yeah, I think that's it's lovely and simple, but so effective. I think so. I hope that help, help can help other people as well. As well. Yeah, Great. we are so hard on ourselves. You know, it's like if this was your best friend and they did the exact same thing, you would not be reacting the same way. <laughs> We're so hard on ourselves. Yeah, it's good to Great. give. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing everybody. But I think the time is almost up now or it's already up. So maybe we can do some Dana talk uh, and then just, yeah, close the session. Is that okay for everybody? I hope. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you for having me again. We would like to thank you very much for being here, Aya. And thank you for sharing with us and teaching us. It's really, Great to have your presence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll be back next month if you're if you're up for it. We'll see about how everybody took this one. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Okay. And thank you. If anybody would like to look at the monastery and find out more about Aya Chitananda, you can look on the website, which is karunabv.org. I put it in the chat box as well. And Aya has very generously said that she would like today's session to be for the benefit of the Anacampa project. So if anybody would like to financially support Venerable Chandra's retreat or the Anacampa project in full, then you can do so by the normal link, which is anacampaproject.org forward slash donate. And thank you all for being here. It's great to see you all again. I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks time. Thank you. Uh, I'll just stop the recording and I'll unmute everybody to say goodbye. <laughs>